Welcome everybody to today's episode of the Great Birth Rebellion podcast, where we grapple with current research and historical knowledge to help you get the best out of your pregnancy, birth and postpartum journey. My name is Dr. Melanie Jackson at Melanie the Midwife. I'm a clinical and research midwife with my PhD, which is why I send out a weekly email which contains the resources that we use to create every single Great Birth Rebellion episode. You can join the podcast mailing list at melaniethemidwife.com. Our Great Birth Rebellion premium members also get access to podcast transcripts, additional resources, the Ask Mel a Question button, and an exclusive monthly Ask Me Anything episode where I answer listener questions. That said... Let's get into it. Welcome everybody to today's episode of The Great Birth Rebellion. I'm your host, Dr. Melanie Jackson, and today's topic is meconium in the waters, or the medical term is meconium stained lycor, or meconium stained amniotic fluid, or your healthcare provider might call it MEC, M-E-C for short. Or they might just tell you that your baby's done a poo in the waters. But for the sake of lyrical flow today, I'm just going to call it MEC. So if I say MEC, here, meconium stained amniotic fluid. But essentially, meconium stained lycor or MEC or meconium on the waters means that during your pregnancy or labor, your baby releases its bowels and does its first poo in the amniotic fluid or in your waters. And that's what we're talking about today. And I'm going to start by explaining what meconium is and then what meconium stained amniotic fluid is and its different classifications, thick, thin, early, late, and the implications of these differences in consistency and timing. And I'm going to help everybody to understand under which circumstances is MEC concerning. And then I'll explain the various reasons for MEC and the likelihood of your baby being either completely unaffected or the likelihood that your baby will experience complications as a result. And then I'd like to explain what your maternity care might look like if there's MEC in your waters and which of these strategies are grounded in research and which are done just because of policy and clinical uncertainty. With that said, let's get into it. Okay, firstly, what is meconium? So meconium is the first poo your baby will do and you'll see it on a nappy or soon after birth all over yourself and your towels if you've done skin to seek skin. And you'll see it's very dark. It's about the color of dark chocolate or near black. And I want to give you a top tip for new parents. If you apply a barrier oil like olive oil or nut oil or or coconut oil or even a barrier cream over your baby's bum before putting on the first nappy, you'll save yourself the tricky cleanup job of the first poo because meconium poo is typically very sticky and difficult to clean off your baby. Now, meconium is the first poo because typically your baby doesn't poo in utero during pregnancy. It does wee, but it doesn't poo. And when it does, it's this one poo that they've been saving up throughout the pregnancy. So if you have meconium stained lycor, then your baby has done a poo in the amniotic fluid that it's growing in and that it has been growing in through your whole pregnancy. And the only way to truly know if your baby's done a poo in the waters is if your waters have broken. There are no tests or anything that can detect that until your waters break themselves. There are some new thoughts, uh, some sonographers uh, thinking that, you know, we they can check how opaque the fluid is, but that does not have high level of accuracy. So we haven't really started using any kind of technology that can detect meconium in the waters before the waters have broken. And just in case you're wondering... I do not believe that breaking waters to check the colour is a suitable maternity care strategy. And I have seen that done before where clinicians are collecting bits and pieces of information about a woman's health and a baby's health. And then they think they'd love to know the colour of the waters. And so a strategy sometimes is to check if there's meconium in the waters by breaking them. I don't personally recommend that. Now, there is a general understanding that the gut of a baby in utero doesn't have its own microbiome and that this is established from the time of birth through contact with the outside world and during skin to skin, through breast milk consumption, 
And so there's a thought that meconium is actually sterile and doesn't have its own microbiome like adults. Like when we do a poo, it's full of bacteria. You know, there's pathological organisms there that if they got into another part of our body would make us sick. That's not the case with babies. So there have been studies on this and some have showed that there is some bacterial load in meconium. However, other studies have shown that there isn't. And the studies that show that there's not bacteria or there's no microbiome in the meconium poo, they state that the studies that have found bacteria in meconium have done so because they've collected contaminated poo samples because they wait till the poo comes out. So the studies that found that there was no microbiome or no uh, particular bacterial load in meconium, those studies go in and retrieve the poo from little bubbers who have yet to pass their first poo. And so they, yeah, they collect it, I guess, with a swab or something. And when they check those samples, they seem to indicate that meconium is indeed sterile and doesn't add bacteria and pathological organisms to the amniotic fluid when it's passed into the waters. So midwives do ha- and have talked about this through history. It's certainly what I learnt that meconium is sterile, and even if babies are inhaling it and swallowing it, it's not always problematic because it's not like it has a massive bacterial load. Having said that, there are some research papers that suggest that the composition of meconium actually can allow for bacteria to grow. It kind of becomes a a medium for growth, but we'll talk about that later. But essentially for now, the information seems to lean towards meconium being devoid of a microbiome. And it's a fair statement to say that it's sterile. And you can read some of those studies in the resource folder if you're on the mailing list for this podcast. We send out all the resources for every single episode And these papers are in that resource folder this week. So if meconium is your baby's first poo, then meconium-stained amniotic fluid or lycor or mech in the waters is your baby doing their first poo in the amniotic fluid. And the seriousness of this circumstance ranges all the way from being a completely normal circumstance and not causing any issues at all all the way through to circumstances where the presence of meconium in the waters can lead to death or illness for the baby. And if you've come to this episode with this as part of your experience, I want to express my sincere sympathies and I hope this episode doesn't come across as insensitive given your experience. So although this is incredibly rare, I do want to communicate that while most of the time meconium stained fluid is harmless or mech is harmless, Practitioners need to be highly educated in this area to know under which circumstances is right to be concerned and act and which circumstances require no action. So we'll move into that next is how do we work out which mech is less concerning and which is more concerning. And to do that, we need to understand the different types of mech. All right, we're going to go deep into meconium classification, the most sexy topic ever. Uh, so there are different types of meconium stained fluid. And firstly, we'll divide it into thin versus thick. That's a very basic metric. And then also want to talk about primary meconium stained fluid, where the meconium is present from early in the labor. So basically from the time that your waters break, the meconium is just there. And compare that to new onset meconium where this develops later in labor, where the fluid was previously clear and then at some stage through the labor, the baby does a poo and it changes to meconium stained lycor. And this is where the importance of practitioner skill and understanding comes in because some of these circumstances are more concerning than others. So a very basic metric is if the mech is thin and a more yellow consistency with no particles, and has been present since the time the waters broke, then this is of least concern. However, if the waters break and the meconium is thick and a darker green, so it can vary from being sort of a lightish green with no particles, that might be more thin, 
And we're moving more into thicker meconium. If you start to see little chunky bits or particles of poo, then we're talking, we're moving further along the spectrum into thicker meconium. And the thickest meconium looks like what midwives call pea soup. So if you're told that you've got pea soup meconium, this is considered 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 the thickest type of meconium and it does look really chunky and it contains particles and that's more concerning than the thin yellow mech and if it changes so a separate thing again is if your waters are clear when they break and then part way through the labor the, the baby does a poo in your waters Regardless of if it's thin or thick in these circumstances, your practitioner should start to ask more questions about why this has happened. So in the resource folder, you'll see for for clinicians who are interested in this, and this is potentially a new thought for you, is really, is there a difference between meconium that was always there and meconium that just started. Yes, there is, and there's research papers on it. Of course, I found them. So there was there's two papers in the resource folder, one's from 2017 and the other one's from 2022. So they're fairly recent. And the first paper, the, this study was done to compare pregnancy outcomes between births complicated with new onset meconium, so that's if your waters are already broken and, you, and then there's meconium, and then compare that to labors where meconium was present in the first place. This was a smaller study. So there was 694 women eligible for this study. 537 were complicated by primary meconium. So it was already there when their waters broke. And 157 by secondary meconium. So the waters were clear. And then during the labor, meconium happened. So this study found that only secondary meconium, the meconium that happens during labor, was associated with an increased risk of needing to intervene in the birth and changes in the well-being of the baby. And the adverse neonatal outcomes also differed significantly. So if if meconium develops through labor, in this particular study, 17.2% of babies had a complicating factor associated with that. And compared to 8.9% where the baby, there was already meconium in the fluids when the waters broke. So what this study concluded was that secondary meconium is associated with a higher rate of adverse obstetric and neonatal outcomes compared to if there was always meconium in the waters. And in a minute, I'm going to explain what the reasons for MEC are. And, the, and why this primary versus secondary meconium thing is important, it will make a lot more sense. There was a second study done, which is actually significantly bigger and also more recent. And this study had the same findings as that earlier 2017 study that was smaller. This study had 9,400 women who had primary meconium. So again, that means that when their waters broke, the meconium was already there. And 1,484 had secondary meconium, where meconium stain lycor developed through the labor. What they found, again, in this study was that there was less chance of women having a spontaneous vaginal birth if they had secondary meconium. And they were more likely to try and speed up the birth with cesarean section or operative vaginal births with vacuum forceps um and episiotomy and things so if it was primary meconium in this group the chance of having an operative vaginal birth was 9.7 percent and that increased to 17.6 with seven with secondary meconium and again in this study 14 percent of women who had primary meconium had a cesarean section versus 17.8 in the secondary group APGARs for the baby, so the score that we give a baby when it's born in terms of its well-being, were also lower for babies with secondary meconium. And in this study, babies who experienced secondary meconium during labor had a higher rate of everything, Uh, jaundice, needing oxygen therapy. Interestingly, one of the bigger concerns with with meconium in the waters is 
meconium aspiration, which we'll talk about later, the rates were no different in each group. So we'll look at the details of that as well. But overall, when they put together all the stats for all the possible outcomes, so low APGAR scores, an increased hospital stay, admission to special care nursery, jaundice, the requirement of oxygen therapy, meconium stained aspiration and hypoglycemia. Babies who always had meconium in their waters had a 2.8% chance of having a complication because of that. So of the 9,043 babies that had primary meconium, 2.8% experienced a complication from that. With secondary meconium, where the baby does a poo during labour and that previously the waters were clear, of 1,484 babies, 5% had some kind of complication as a result. So still, although there is a risk, that that's where it sits, around that mark where even the most concerning meconium situation, the secondary meconium, results in about 5% of babies having a complication. And that's not to say 5% are going to have a serious complication. That could include just a lower APGAR score at birth, uh, some needing some um, phototherapy or oxygen treatment, but that's where it sits. So the majority of babies... So if you had secondary meconium, 95% of babies would be completely fine. And if there was primary meconium, then what's those numbers? 97.2% of babies would be completely fine. Okay, now we're going to do the reasons why you might have meconium in your waters, why your baby might do a poo. And it occurs in approximately 15 to 20% of full-term pregnancies. But this number does increase to 30 to 40% in post-term pregnancy. So probably from about 41 weeks onwards, your baby's got a 30 to 40% chance of having done meconium poo. And the reason for this is that the baby can just be old enough to poo. So babies before 37 weeks or at term are far less likely to have mech and the likelihood of MEC in later gestation labours is much higher. So as I said, about 30 to 40%. Some papers have suggested that up to 50% of post-term pregnancies can be complicated by meconium in the waters compared to that stat that I just said before, 15 to 20% of pregnancies. Only 5% of pregnancies less than 37 weeks are complicated by meconium. And so mech in the waters is often considered as just a sign that your baby is mature enough to poo. The other reasons why your baby might do a poo is that it's a breech baby. There are also a number of maternal illnesses that can make the baby more likely to poo. So particular liver conditions, cholestasis, things like preeclampsia. And the other reason is that it can be a sign that the baby is stressed by something in labour. Anything that can stress a baby can cause meconium. And this could include the induction process, malposition of the baby, all kinds of things can cause stress in a baby during labour. And this could trigger meconium to be passed. And earlier in the episode, we were talking about this secondary meconium. And one reason why the secondary meconium is considered more pathological, I suppose, than primary meconium in the waters is because secondary meconium can be linked to this, the cause of being stressed, where the baby might actually be struggling with the process of labor and then does a poo. And that's why the secondary meconium is considered more sinister than the primary meconium and why your care provider might act differently if meconium develops rather than has always been there. What I'm trying to say here too is that not all mech is sinister. Most of the time, meconium in the waters is not a pathological or concerning thing unless it's linked to other signs and symptoms that your baby is stressed in labor. But meconium is unlikely to be the only sign that your baby is distressed. So we use meconium in the waters as 
part of developing a symptom picture, if we're concerned for the mum or the baby, then meconium just adds to our sort of clinical assessment of that circumstance. Meconium alone is unlikely to be a sign of stress. If your baby was stressed in labour, there would very likely be other signs and symptoms and meconium just adds to that collective decision making. Now, what are the consequences of having MEC? I can't possibly list all the possible consequences of MEC, except to say that the range of babies who have MEC during labour has been reported to be between 15 to 20% of all labours. And the most feared and serious consequence of having meconium is meconium aspiration syndrome, MAS, which can be a life-threatening neonatal respiratory disorder. So your baby would get a respiratory respiratory illness that results from breathing in aspiration of meconium into the lungs. Either they gasp in utero or at the time of their first breath after they're born. Now, this serious consequence, meconium aspiration syndrome, it develops in about 5% of infants who were delivered through meconium like or through, through meconium stain amniotic fluid. And approximately 4% of babies, if they get meconium aspiration syndrome, will die of that. And it accounts for around 2% of all newborn deaths. So if we use those stats to work out the percentage chance, so if 15 to 20% of babies have MEC, 5% of those 15 to 20 will develop meconium aspiration syndrome. And of that 5%, 4% of those infants will very sadly not survive that circumstance. So if we do that by 1,000 babies, so out of 1,000 babies, 1,000 births, a maximum of 200 babies will be born through meconium stained lycor. So if we go with the 20%, 1,000 births, 200 of those will happen through meconium. 5% of those 200 will develop meconium aspiration syndrome. And that is, so that's 10 babies. 5% of 200 is 10 babies who would develop meconium aspiration syndrome. And of those 10 babies, 4% will sadly die as a result of that. And 4% of 10 is 0.4%. That's my maths. But there is another study that stated that the range sits between 0.24% and 1.4%, with the higher range being for those more mature babies closer to 42 weeks, owing to the fact that meconium in the waters is more likely at that gestation. So if you do have meconium in the waters and the worst, absolute worst should happen that your baby develops meconium aspiration syndrome, which is about 10 in 1,000 babies, your ch- the chance of your baby surviving this circumstance is a minimum, if we go with the 1.4%, is a minimum of 98.6%. So those are the stats. If you need to go back and listen to those again, a little bit of a summary, 1,000 babies, 200 will be born through meconium. 5% of those 200 will develop meconium aspiration syndrome. That's 10 babies. And 4% of those 10 babies will very sadly not survive having had meconium aspiration. So that's the most serious thing that can happen if you've got meconium in your waters. Now, knowing that this is a possibility, if you do have MEC, there are going to be some changes to your care if you're arriving in hospital and there's also going to be changes if you're at home. So let's have a look what the management of your labour might look like if you present with either meconium in the waters or it develops through the labour. So if you do have MEC and you're at home, You can expect from your care provider that they will probably be able to consider all the other elements of your birth experience and your pregnancy. And if there are other signs and symptoms of normalcy or pathology, they will use their midwifery and clinical expertise to decide if this particular meconium situation is of the concerning variety, is it thick, is it secondary, or if this is most likely not going to cause a problem.
unless your care provider is employed by a facility. So some of you might be having home births with publicly funded programs, which means that those midwives are likely still under the direction of the hospital. So it's quite possible that if you're at home and you're with a publicly funded service, that they might have a policy to transfer you to hospital. This is different if you've got a private midwife. Private midwives aren't governed by policy. We've got the capacity and the ability to be able to make clinical decisions based on the full symptom picture. So it would be different for you depending on your type of care provider and depending on who employs them. So the next possibility and the most likelihood is that people listening are going to be going into hospital to have their babies, at least here in Australia and most countries. Home birth is not the norm. And we spoke about this last week with Dr. Kirsten Small. We spoke about the place of policy in maternity care and how policies are the most likely things that will determine the type of care that you're going to receive when you arrive to hospital. So just know if you've got meconium in your waters, there's a heightened level of concern around your your labor. And this will very likely expose you to the opportunity to receive or accept interventions such as CTG monitoring. They might tell you that you're not allowed to get in the water and they may have less tolerance around the length of time that you're in labor. These are some of the things that can happen. There are also some policies that will require or that that requires staff to offer you an induction or augmentation in order to speed up your labor. So although I can't tell you for certain what interventions you will be offered, in hospitals and by many healthcare providers, meconium is vis- is interpreted as always pathological or to always have caution. And so the way that many hospital services operate is that if there is a level of risk or what they deem to be an abnormality, you'll always be offered more intervention. So now it's up to you to decipher and use the information that you've learned today, understand what you can learn from your healthcare provider. You may also ask the hospital for their policy on what will happen to you if you have got meconium in the waters. And then it's up to you to make some decisions early on through your pregnancy, which interventions you feel are warranted and which ones you think are not. And you can do that by assessing the absolute risk against the possible risks of the intervention that you're being offered. And also consider, you know, this intervention of CTG monitoring for babies who've got meconium stained liquor. This is to rule out the possibility that your baby's stressed. However, if you go back Listen to the CTG episode that we did with Dr. Kirsten Small. You'll also see the issues around the use of CTG for diagnosis of distress and concern for your baby. And so so the take-home messages today are that meconium in itself is not pathological but can be pathological in certain circumstances. And the decisions about pathology would likely be best made with your care provider and be based on your full clinical picture, not just on the single presence of meconium stained lichor. And we know there's a difference between the outcomes of thin meconium versus thick and primary meconium versus secondary. And I hope this episode has helped you as you make your decisions around meconium stained lichor. And if you want to look deeper into these research papers that I used to create this episode today, join the mailing list and the resources come straight to your email. That's been today's episode of The Great Birth Rebellion, and I'll see you next time.